It is now my honor to ask Catherine Rooney Vera and Bob Pisani to join me on the stage. All right, Catherine Rooney Vera of Stonex is chief strategist at Stonex Group. Catherine has over 22 years of experience in global economics and investment management and brings wealth of, a wealth of knowledge and insight to her role, where she works closely with institutional teams and clients across diverse markets and sectors. Moderating our conversation is CNBC reporter Bob Pisani, who since 1990 has covered Wall Street and the stock market for over 25 years. Mr. Pisani is also the author of Shut Up and Keep Talking, Lessons in Life and Investing from the Floor of the New York Stock Exchange, which tells a series of captivating stories that will reveal what he has learned about life and investing. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Uh, it's an honor for me to be here. I have had a long relationship with STA and Staney in New York. goes back almost 25 years. I, uh, remember my first conference, uh, it's lost in time, but it was 1999 or 2000. We were at the Marriott Marquis. There were almost 4,000 people there. And as I recall, Cool and the Gang was the band uh, that played. Uh, that was 23, 24 years ago, somewhere around there. Uh, I had just become the stocks correspondent in 1997 for CNBC. I was the real estate correspondent for uh, six years before that. So I've been 33 years at CNBC, and it's uh, rather unusual. Most journalists don't stay long time, 26 years, 33 years, anything like that. And I elected to stay because I love this industry. I loved working for CNBC, I still do. I'm very uh, close to the New York Stock Exchange. I don't work for them, but I've spent 27 years down there and I wrote a book partly uh, about the history of trading. Uh, so this organization is very important to me and I've watched it change a lot over the years. Uh, in 1999, it was mostly sell side people. It was mostly people who worked on exchanges mostly people who worked uh, what we call upstairs. Uh, and it's changed. We all know the sell side industry is not what it used to be. It doesn't have the, the strength and power that it used to have. But instead, we have a much more diverse organization in a way. Uh, the options business uh, has exploded. Uh, the ETF business uh, has exploded. Uh, there's data providers. Uh, there's exchanges out there. So there's clearing houses. And we, there's even smatterings of buy side people that are show, occasionally show up. So in a way, not only is it more diverse, it's wonderful to see more women here. It's just wonderful to have lunch upstairs was a big thing. Uh, and, and all of these wonderful new people, younger people, more diverse people are entering the industry. It makes me feel really good. We all know that this used to be a bunch of old white guys that were hanging out here. And it's nice to see more diversity. It means that the future of the industry is stronger and better. Uh, and it's just, it makes me feel good uh, as, uh, as an old white guy, frankly, to see more diversity. We need it. And my congratulations to Jim Toes, who's been a friend of mine for decades, and STA for leading that charge and bringing in uh, more diversity. Uh, I'm very happy to talk to Catherine Rooney Vera uh, from Stonex today. Uh, I had a long conversation with her. She's one of the great macro people in the, in the world. Uh, and she's going to have a lot to say. But Catherine, I just want to start with your impressions of where this industry is, because I always like to say, first thing you ought to start out with is, how is our business doing? How, how is the business that we are all in? And by the way, if you're wondering what business you're in, you could say, well, we're in the trading business. But that doesn't quite capture it, and I'm going to tell you why. It's a little too small, because you're in some very important industry, and I cover your industry, so I'm part of your industry. You're in the dreams business. You could say, oh, I work on a trading desk, or I do algorithms. But think of what the purpose of this game is. The purpose is to ensure retirement for people, to help people get their kids through college, to realize a better life, because we're all investors. So I'd rather say, oh, I'm on a trading desk. Well, that's true, technically, but think broader than that. Think bigger than that. And that's why I like to say, all of us, we're in the dreams business. And when you think about it that way, suddenly it sounds like, I got a pretty important job. I'm, I'm responsible for people's financial futures, for their dreams, and where they want to be and live, and where they want to have their kids in the future. So think of it that way. But 
Give us a sort of sense, you're in this business, where is this industry right now? Yeah, Bob, thank you so much, and it's such a pleasure to be here. As Bob said, I'm the chief market strategist at Stonex. Um, I started five months ago, almost to the day, and like Bob, has a tenure of uh, three decades on financial services. Stonex is about to uh, complete their 100th year anniversary next year. We started out with Saul Stone. Uh, back in the early 1900s, selling eggs door to door. So it's a fascinating firm. But look, I think we have had, uh, you mentioned the, the 4,000 people 25 years ago that were in attendance at, at STA back in the, in the mar uh, marquee. Um, today, it's, it's far less, it's far fewer. And that creative destruction, which has come from su supplanting sell side guys with algo guys, you know, has created that destructive uh, ability in, in employment, but it's made us better. So I think we're better than ever, and we're using that technology and that advancement to the benefit of the end user, to the benefit of that retiree and that person that has got their eggs in the basket for, for retirement and the insurance company. So I, I think we're, we're in a strong position going forward. Yeah, I, the one thing I keep telling this industry is you've got to keep innovating. Yeah. Um, nobody can get stuck in the past. When I got to the floor of the New York Stock Exchange in 1996, open outcry was still the predominant model. There, it is not anymore. <laughs> it's still there. You can theoretically still do it, but thank heavens we have moved forward. Uh, and I always tell people uh, who are nostalgic, uh, I'm sorry, but we need more change, not less change. We yes. need particularly technological innovation, but we also need new financial ideas, new ways of investing. They don't all work out. I have my own opinions about crypto and things like that, about use cases. Uh, they don't all work out, but innovation is the heart of the United States economy, and it's one of the reasons we are leaders in the world. So more change, more innovation, uh, more technology is what we need, not less technology. We want to talk macro about where, where we are in the world right now. It seems to me there's one thing that really matters right now, and that's the direction of interest rates. The stock market is virtually captive to the 10-year yields. You can actually watch it on a daily basis. It's a bit of a joke amongst those of us at CNBC uh, in the morning meetings saying, oh my God, here's another jobs report and yields are you know, skyrocketing again, the market's gonna go down. So tell us where we're at. Number one, explain why yields keep going up, number one. Is, is this because the economy is strong? Is it because there's a supply-demand problem with Treasury? Some people are trying to push this narrative now. What, what's causing the yields to go up? What will cause them to moderate? And what, give us your thoughts on, on yields. Yeah, first it started with um, the, the, the idea that we would be in the soft landing, the realization that economic growth was strong. So you saw that initial leg up from 150 basis points, Bob, that we saw mm -hmm. since the spring of last year because of this positive effect. But now the story has changed. And I think the supply demand story is very real. It's more than a narrative. It's the fact that the US deficit is 9% of GDP. And the US Treasury has to continue to, um, to, to issue. Uh, so that's a real concern, especially when you look at the demand side, Bob, which you see Chinese uh, holdings of U.S. Treasuries diminishing. Now, I'm not saying that this is going to be an, uh, an unraveling of the U.S. Treasury market by any, by any stretch, because as you well know, there's no market as deep and as liquid as the U.S. Treasury market. There is no alternative. There is no substitute to the U.S. dollar, which is de facto and will remain for the foreseeable future the sovereign reserve currency of the world. Um, and I think, of course, the third thing we've all heard, higher for longer, you know. So the higher for longer narrative I think came into play. But at this point, Bob, I think it's more of a capitulation than anything. I mean, when we got to 480, breaking 480 on the 10-year, uh, from my perspective, that, that was a lot of capitulation there. And I personally think that um, higher yields are detrimental, of course, for the economy, for investor sentiment. And I think they're unsustainable in, in their duration. So I do think that U.S. Treasury yields are going to come down. My forecast for this year end is 420. For next year end is 380. Um, and, I, and I do think that, uh, that there are opportunities. I know we're in STA and, and, and focused on equities, but at this juncture, fixed income is looking pretty darn interesting. And, and you, touched the, you, you, you touched the topic of um, uh, the equity risk premium, right? It's exceedingly unattractive at this point. So something's got to give, something's got to break. Uh, and I'm not talking about the Fed breaking things. I'm talking about either you know, we get this rally in fixed income, and is that necessarily positive for equities? Uh, I would debate that, that, that that's the case. So 420, you have year-end for Correct. yield. 
Uh, right now we're about 470, 4.7. Yeah. So you, you think yields are going to come down a half a percent on the long end? Yes, I do. And I think that in the fourth quarter of this year, um, long duration trades are going to get uh, attractive. Well, this is fantastic. Appearance. This would be supportive of the stock market. It would if recession was not in the offing. Because generally when you have this um, you know, equity risk premium kind of improving, then it's good for equity markets. But not when we're talking about the potential, Bob, for earnings to be revised down. There's a very beautiful correlation with, um, beautiful because I'm an economist, but, um, but, but, but a very tight correlation with PMIs. So when PMIs are decelerating, you generally get um, downward revisions in, in earnings growth. And I think it's difficult to imagine, Bob, a scenario where corporates' margins improve under this triple whammy of higher labor costs, you know, higher energy costs, and higher, uh, uh, higher interest rates for corporations to continue, and I think we talked about this on our call, in the fourth quarter to see robust earnings growth. And just to finish this, I think, I don't know how many of you agree with the, the current consensus in the S&P 500, but I certainly don't, that next year is gonna see 12% earnings growth. I think valuations are so stretched um, at this point that, um, that earnings are, are probably going to be downwardly revised, and I would add to that that 12% earnings growth is the equivalent to 5.5% nominal growth. In my view, that's very unlikely. Nominal growth in the US of 5.5% is very unlikely. So something's got to give here. Um, and I think that, that equities are probably going to be that, that well, escape well, why haven't Why haven't the earnings estimates come down? I mean, remember what happened a year ago the market just tanked yep. because everyone assumed that the earnings were going to come down and we were going to have a recession. All of this was wrong. Mm -hmm. So if you would have made an investment on that theory a year ago, you would have lost a bunch of money. Yep. And yet, even now, I just did a whole story on Q3 numbers and Q4 numbers. Not only are they not coming down, yeah, they've up. actually gone up a little bit in Q3 and in notably in Q4. Now something's wrong here because prices have come down. So the, the, the PE ratio, the multiple has come down and earnings have gone up here. So it, we're now trading at something on the order of 17 and a half times forward earnings 20 into 2024. Uh, that's not historically rich, but it may be rich if you're going into a recession at all. I guess my question is, what, why, my, what, what bothers me is we saw in the middle of September yields just blow up, mm -hmm. the market fell apart. If corporate America was worried about it then, you'd think they would have turned around and issued earnings warnings. And yet we didn't see an avalanche of earnings warnings. It's almost like either the corporation said, we don't have any idea what's going on, we're not saying anything, or they're not as that worried. Pepsi just came out yesterday and they had a, an excellent report. Everyone was worried about weight loss drugs and they just poo-pooed that. So I guess I'm trying to figure out is who's wrong here? You think the analysts or, or the companies aren't warning people enough? I mean, because I'm waiting for this deluge of warnings from companies and lowering guidance. It hasn't happened so far. You're right. And guidance is going to be important. My suspicion is that because it hasn't happened as yet does not mean that it's not going to. I think what we've lived so far year to date is an aberration rather than a new reality. And that goes across asset classes and from an economic perspective as well. Why haven't we had a recession yet? Why, haven't, why, haven't, why hasn't the leveraged loan market tanked in any way, shape, or form? Why haven't we seen a, a credit cycle turn? When the Fed jacks up rates 525 basis points over 15 months, you would think something would break. Why hasn't it happened? Why hasn't it happened? In my view, is because of the longevity of liquidity. It's been enormous. And now you look at when's that expiring? That's expiring by the end of this year, Bob. You see 3.5% savings rate in the US. If you look at real rates at about 2%, savings rate should be at 6 to 7%. The checking account. So people are spending the money down. People are spending the money. And here's the, here's the, here's the key point. That's going to stop. Why is it going to stop? Because it, it cannot, you cannot com, continue to increase yeah. your leverage ratios when interest rates are going up, um, and, uh, and, and the consumer confidence um, is taking a hit from inflation and higher interest rates. Does so it really come down to, I mean, you're basically talking about liquidity, and it's amazing to me 
that it's hard to figure out one thing that really matters in the world, but liquidity seems to be the one issue that really does matter. Yeah. How much money is sloshing around right. all over the place? And when the Fed pumped money into the system, it got into the stock market. So there's, the, the, I'm trying to say there's a generic principle here about liquidity is a very good thing to look at, right? And when people, even in households, have more liquidity, savings rates are higher, or they get money from the government, that's more money sloshing around in their bank accounts, and something happens to mm -hmm. it. So liquidity, I'm, I'm trying to support your point of view, is a very good way to look at the world. I, I think it really does matter. Well, there's liquidity from the injection of monetary stimuli, and there's liquidity from the injection of fiscal stimuli, mm -hmm. and both of those are coming to an end. So, so I think that we would be remiss to think that the base case scenario here is this if fabled no landing that, from my view, is a pipe dream. I mean, you cannot wholly discard the economic cycle yeah. because it has been delayed by now. So all these economic tools that, that we've used in the past um, certainly shouldn't all be considered debunked. Right. So should the Fed, we're, given, first of all, the probability of a soft land is extremely unusual. Historically the, improbable. Right. And so, there, so far, we, the, the Fed has achieved an historically improbable event. Right. But you're saying that that's not going to We are going to have a recession. How severe is this recession going to be and when is it going to come? It's Goldilocks on the surface. So the Fed looks at this. If they looked at it a year ago, they said, wow, we did it. Mission accomplished. You know, we're good because inflation is coming down and that's fantastic. Um, but if you look beneath the, certain, beneath the surface, the impact of high real rates, and they're only going to get higher if, in fact, inflation continues its downward trajectory, has not yet been felt. But we're starting to see those numbers come up in consumer delinquencies, in car loan delinquencies. Uh, in the inability of people to obtain credit. So it's not just about, about, about getting that loan at 5 to 8 to 10 percent. It's even, even achieving the ability to get it. 50 like percent of banks are now tightening their lending standards. So I think the combination favors a retrenchment in the U.S. consumer, which, as we all know, is all important in the U.S. economy. So but you didn't get to the point. When is a recession going to start oh, in right. the next six, six months? How severe is it going to be? You know, there's recessions, then there's recessions. Right, yeah. Yeah, this is not 2008 because if you look at the leverage of the consumer, we have learned to some extent our lesson. Yes, we still spend beyond our means, but we're not as levered as we were back in 08. If you look at the leverage ratio versus discretionary spending, it's come down m massively. So when we talk about recession, we should, be, we should talk about a swoon and then from an equities market perspective, be ready to take advantage of the inflection point for upside for, for 2024, 2025. I think that recession has a 60% probability uh, for next year. Um, I think uh, the labor market, despite the last data point that we saw, is slowing down. I do believe that corporations are feeling margin pressure and there will be downward revision to, to earnings, to earnings uh, estimates. So the Fed is moving towards their target. We, yeah. we, we see CPI come down, we see PCE, right. uh, their preferred gauge of inflation, moving in the right direction. We had people on Monday, Fed officials saying, this may be fine with us. We, we may be willing to pause. Are they going to pause? No more rate hikes from, from this point on? And, and yeah. when do they start talking about rate cuts? More meaningful from my perspective, I, I, my terminal rate is five and a half percent, so that means one twenty-five basis point increase more, but who cares about that? More meaningful, I think, from my perspective is what do they do next year? Do they really cut 50 bips? Do they cut 100 basis points? Um, and is that actually going to be good for equities? And I was talking with Dr. Claudia Sam, who's my friend here sitting in the, in the front row, but we were talking about how important real rates are, and the Fed is probably targeting real rates rather than nominal rates. Yeah. So if you stay higher for longer, that's not the same as restrictive for longer. Um, so in a, in a sense, it, I think if we do enter recession, the Fed's going to cut. Um, but even if we enter a slowdown, real rates are going to continue to climb because inflation should, uh, should decelerate. Real rates, of course, being, you know, f five, five and a half percent right. minus inflation. Um, so if the Fed is in fact targeting real rates of two and a half percent, yes, we could get cuts by middle of next year. But is it a positive thing for equities? I think in the environment of a deceleration in economic activity, likely revisions to the downside uh, on earnings growth, that it may well not be, which is why I'm recommending defensive sectors in the S&P uh, okay. Well, let's get into the stock market then. Where, where are we going to be in 2024? First of all, overall, S&P 500, a year from now, higher or lower? Lower. 
I favor fixed income over no, equities. No, by the way, we, we've got no, we're, we're, we're flat, flat two yeah. years. For essentially, we'll draw the lines. We haven't really gone anywhere for two years. But so you think we're actually going to be lower? I think flat to lower. I think there's more opportunity in fixed income. Um, treasuries are looking pretty juicy right now. Um, fixed income in general, agency mortgage-backed securities are looking very enticing in terms of real yields and relative yeah. value. Um, so yeah, I think if you look at utilities, utilities are basically a bond proxy. So if you do expect that the Fed is peaking in terms of its rate hikes um, and may even cut, then you want to be in utilities. They're the boring sectors. I get it. Just it just went through the but the stable. greatest price upheaval probably in their history in the last two right. months. It's they're been the cheapest a, a in catastrophe. The it's yeah. not, no, it's not cheap. It's a catastrophe. <laughs> if you would have owned utilities two months I'm ago, you'd now. be down you know, 30%. Agreed. I mean, Agreed. nobody's ever seen that with utilities yeah, that's right. happening. Well, last year with 2022, you had uh, fixed income in general down 30%. You had the equity market down 15%. So, yes, utilities have gotten decimated as fixed income has gotten decimated because they're basically a, uh, a proxy yeah. for bonds, and we right? And we have utilities now with 7 8% yield Correct. right now. H historically, that's way out of whack. Usually, yeah. nice ones are from the 4% range, occasionally 5%, 8 I did a whole list of them the other right. day. It, that, that's really shocking. So yeah. you get, there's questions about whether that can hold. Right. When you get up that high, this happens with the oil companies too, is sustainability of the dividend becomes an issue mm -hmm. uh, for the companies. So it's, it's a little disconcerting. Um, let me just talk about the competition with bonds because this is something the viewers of CNBC are really interested in. Yeah. Um, I made a big joke about my mother in, in March. My mother was the head teller of the bank, our local bank, for decades and knows all the tellers. And in the middle of March, she called me from the bank with the bank, her bank teller <laughs> friend sitting there saying, Robert, I can get 4% on a one-year CD? Yeah. Uh, my bank account's 0.3%? I'm going to transfer money. I said, well, Mom, that makes a lot of sense, Mom. Uh, by the way, the banks are having trouble because that you're doing what everyone else is doing, and they're going to have to pay you more to keep that money in the deposits. So the bank earnings, are, you know, they're worried about what's going on. And she said, Robert, I could care less about the bank earnings. I have spent... 15 years with 0.3% in right. my savings account, they're offering me four. And the tellers are telling me if I wake a few weeks more, it'll be higher. I said, you, you, the, the tellers are now bond arbitragers. This is my 95-year-old mother. So she's a bond arbitrager. She's on JP Morgan's desk. I said, Mom, just buy the CD. Buy the one. It's a good idea. Take, well, I'm taking more money out. Right? And then she called me a few weeks ago. <laughs> Robert, I can Robert. get 5% now. 5%? No, I'm going to take more money out of my... I said, Mom, the banks are going nuts with people like you. You know, it really is a problem. But uh -huh. go ahead. That's, so the viewers, my mother, they, they love sitting there at their 5%. Now, that's serious competition for the stock Absolutely. market for the first time in decades. What are we now with? The 2% real return on right. the, for 5%? Some, whatever you want to pick as your inflation target. And you mentioned the equity risk premium. Those of you who don't know, the equity risk premium is the amount you're being compensated ab oh. above... Uh, for owning uh, versus a risk-free return. And the equity risk premium right now is below 1%, Negative. probably. Yeah. Um, so if you take a 5% 10-year yield, uh, minus expectations for what people are expecting in the stock market, it's, it's either flat or negative at this point. Mm -hmm. So the viewers are perfectly happy to sit around with these, with these 5%. And Not good for us traders. How, <laughs> does that, how does that factor in as a competition for the market that we have six trillion dollars in money market funds some of it people taking their money out of their bank accounts but that's very serious competition for the it stock absolutely market. is and when you look at equity uh, you look at the uh, earnings yield versus the high what with the high high yield market earns and uh, versus the risk-free asset it's it's a no-brainer to go your mom's a very smart lady robert is it really no-brainer call me robert is it is it really <laughs> I hear my mother. You, 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 <laughs> That's why I said you, it. Don't do that. I, <laughs> but is it really competition? Because the S&P is up 10% still, even with all the turmoil. Yes, all right, so big tech stocks are what's moving it. But, you know, you've grown the broad market. I don't know. Why aren't they getting FOMO? Why aren't they saying, oh, geez, well, I'm getting 5%, but the stock market's still up 10%. The, well, when you compare the risk-free asset to something extraordinarily really risky, it, it, the relative value favors, of course, the risk-free asset. So I think that's the very clear answer. Um, but, but I think you're kind of alluding to the 60-40 the portfolio. So, the, you know, I think n now is the time to start going long, if we're not already long, um, five-year, 10-year duration in the risk-free world. 
because that rate is very likely going to come down, yeah. especially if we see a retrenchment in, in growth. Inflation, if you believe that 60-40 is out the window, the reason you believe that is because you think that we're going to see decades-long high inflation and the central banks are not going to be able to tame inflation and these really expensive alternatives um, that you pay up for are going to beat the plain vanilla. Um, so I think that uh, I think we have to be diversified. I think going into next year, fixed income is the play. And within the equities sphere, my top picks are um, utilities, staples, which do well in this environment. They're the boring ones. We're not talking about tech here. You know, uh, We're talking about healthcare. We're talking about late cycle sectors, late cycle economic sectors, such as industrials and energy. Um, these are the plays going into next year. Um, tech you know, you has didn't, had You didn't say. mention technology. You didn't say. Yeah, I'm a, I would say um, tech has, has run its course. I think you alluded a, bit, a little bit to advancing in technology. AI and the MAG7, we all know the stories, and probably there's some intricacies with regard to the MAG7, and that's why 4Q earnings, uh, earnings uh, are, are looking rosy. Um, probably because of that, but that's all talk about AI. But where is the execution? Where is the execution? This is a long time in coming in terms of adoption of AI. And we're gonna see that flow through into productivity numbers. So again, going back to the economic principles and how they affect markets, is that this is a lot of hype until AI delivers. And we have not seen that yet. In all of these massive corporations in the S&P 500, how many of them talk about AI in their earnings reports? which was, if you Google it, how, what was the most commonly named uh, uh, point, uh, word in earnings? And it's AI, it's tech. But how many of them have adopted it? How many of them have boosted their productivity as a result? Very few. Um, so I think that in an environment of restrictive for longer, in an environment of decelerating economic activity with an elevated risk of, uh, of, of recession, um, that we should not be going for the, the high flyers that have done so well year to date, but rather do that rotation into the more boring sectors that historically outperform. Yeah. But it's in not irrational, periods. is it? I mean, they're putting the money in the areas that have the biggest earnings growth potential. So growth has won out over value in yes. the last 15 years. So yes. talk to me about that disparity. Whatever happened, we all know what the academic studies yeah. show. Long term, Value outperforms growth, small cap outperforms big cap, except it hasn't, not in the last 15 years, not to any, in, in, any streak that where that has happened has been very short lived. Why, why has that happened? Is well, you, there something you, wrong with the academic theories? Yeah, I think there's a lot wrong with the academic theories, but you were, we were talking earlier about the six month horizon versus the you know, long term horizon. And of course, when you look at decades long, equities are always going to beat bonds, equities are going to beat everything, so you want to be long equities. But if we're talking in this traders association of six to 12 month horizon or even shorter term, um, then I think we want to be very pragmatic about what has done well year to date, what has been, as you said, decimated, and where value is at the moment. But of course, as you say, if we get a big yeah. correction over the long term, you want to be long equities, you want to be long the growth sectors. But at this juncture and looking at the economic scenario as I see it, um, I do think that we need to be more judicious in our, in our portfolio selection uh, and specifically target those sectors that historically outperform in, you know, not stagflation, but, but inflation that has not yet reached target yeah. unless we get a recession. What, what, this is a broad question and off topic a little bit, what responsibilities do does the, we as the financial industry have about educating people on financial literacy? One, one of the things that concerns me mm -hmm. is we kind of talk like we're traders uh, and I don't know how much you move your portfolio around. I'm a Jack Bogle disciple. I'm, I've made almost no changes in 20 years in my portfolio. Yeah. My, I could describe it. In fact, I wrote a book with a chapter describing what I own. And I own S&P 500, I a small cap value fund. I own an international fund. I mean, you could put it on, a, on an index card, what I own. And p people look at this and they say, this is it? You own this? You're the senior markets correspondent, whatever your title is for CNBC, and you're, you know, they're waiting for me to give them the secret sauce, like I own leverage inverse Malaysian bonds or something that nobody ever heard of. Yeah. Oh, of course, uh, yes, we all know these things. The, all those of us who are in the hedge fund community. No, I don't. I don't own anything weird or exotic. Um, and when, the problem I have with talking about six months, I think utilities yeah. is this would have been a disastrous idea eight months ago. And yet if you would have just owned the S&P 500, you wouldn't have to have 
pick those winners well, you weren't and losers. Thinking, and, and the market timing doesn't work gotcha. at all. But That's we're dealing problem. with the Fed. And the Fed six months ago, we all knew was not near its peak. Now we know it's at its peak. So when you look at the past eight Federal Reserve tightening cycles, when they reach their end, when, they're, when they've, the last hiking, the very last hike, Bob, over the next six to 12 months, both stocks and bonds outperform. Yeah. But more bonds. Bonds historically, on average, on those past eight Fed tightening cycles, drop 100 basis points over the course of the next 12 months yeah. from the last hike. Yeah. So yeah, if you look at the six to 12 month horizon, it's a different story. Um, but stocks generally don't do well if the curve is inverted. So after the last hiking hike, equities and bonds both do well, but, the curve's but getting equities steeper. don't do as well as bonds if the curve right. The curve's is getting inverted. steeper though. It is. That's why I like flatteners. <laughs> okay. I think right now is the time to start looking long duration. I think 4Q is the time to start looking long duration. Um, I'm going to, we, we have only a couple more minutes. Yeah. Is there anybody who has any questions, thoughts, uh, as long as nobody gives any speeches, I'll, I'll, <laughs> if somebody wants to raise their hand, I'll be happy to do that. Um, let me just ask you about geopolitics yeah. because um, obviously there's an additional risk factor. Geopolitics is always a risk factor out there, but we tend to ignore it mm -hmm. unless it's staring in the face. But we already had one big geopolitical risk factor with Russia, Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, now we have this, this terrible, uh, invasion in Israel. I don't know what we're using the word we're using for it, but I call it an invasion in Israel. Um, how, how does this figure figure into your thinking? I'm calling it a massacre and an atrocity. Um, so, so what I think is that uh, the oil price surge that we saw in 2021 was more of a, a demand issue. So, so there was pent up demand. Guys needed the oil. They would pay whatever they take for it, whatever whatever it takes to, to pay for that oil. Now it's a supply issue. So, so I think it's less of an inflationary impulse and more of a potential to dampen demand. Um, so if we get a conflagration in this, in this tumult that encompasses Syria, Egypt, Hezbollah, I know Iran's obvious, Saudi Arabia, um, I think the markets could be underestimating the impact that that could have in front loading or bringing forward the risk of economic contraction in the US. One final thing is historically oil prices and bond yields move in line. So oil prices go up, bond yields go up. Why? Because they follow an economic cycle, the similar, similar economic outlook. But in this case, um, probably it's not going to happen. Oil prices are going to go up, I think bond, bond yields are going to go down. Why? Because we're seeing this destruction in demand. We're seeing it now, and it's only going to be aggravated. And yet the oil prices have been relatively tame throughout all of this. It's quite remarkable. It is remarkable. That. Let's see what Saudi Arabia does next year. You yeah. know, if they continue to, to rein in production or if the Biden administration... Uh, no, I mean just in the last few days. With yeah, of course. Here. Absolutely. Yeah, the markets seem to be taking it uh, with a grain of salt. Can I ask you a question? Okay. Can I turn the tables a little bit? Just don't, just don't say Robert. <laughs> I'm like six years Robert. old again. You brought up the Robert. Um, what, what have you seen over three decades here, Bob, that you could tell us has most changed? And where do you see, and, and has, have the lessons, you've seen a lot. You've seen the dot-com bubble burst. You've seen, you know, the 9-11 terrorist attacks. You've seen a lot of market gyrations. What have you learned from that? What has changed and what do you see? You know what I, what I learned forward? is uh, how amazing resilient the U.S. system is. Um, wh why, why are we the most successful mm -hmm. country economically probably ever. Mm -hmm. uh, it's because of the way the political system is set up. It's because of the way the judicial system is set up because you have enforcement of contracts where disputes can be settled by an impartial judge. And so you have a commercial code that is dramatically expanded and it's enforceable in a legitimate way. I mean, you don't have to bribe judges mm -hmm. uh, and you think, well, uh, duh, but there are places in the world where you do have to do that. Of course. Um, you have a system that, where you have a democratic system of maximum amount of personal freedom and representation with a political uh, system, with an economic system, excuse me, which we call capitalism, uh, which I think is the best combination of bringing people out of poverty that's ever been invented. Mm -hmm. uh, 300 years ago, during the Industrial Revolution, it started over in England, and uh, it is the only system that has lifted mass numbers of people out of poverty, including in China, 
where Deng Xiaoping reversed Mao Zedong in the 1960s, a disaster. We don't even know how many millions of people died mm -hmm. under Mao Zedong. And Deng Xiaoping came in and said, we are going to essentially bring in a state form of capitalism. It wasn't a democracy, but it lifted millions of people out of poverty because they adopted capitalist systems. In Europe, there is, Europe is capitalist, but it is a much, there's more state capitalism, more control over the means of production by governments. In my opinion, that makes the system less efficient because capitalism is a ruthlessly efficient allocator of capital because the individuals and corporations control the means of production. So this is the essential heart of the genius of the American system, which is why we have all prospered. And when I see that under assault, I get very nervous. And I have been amazed at watching our own little world, which is the financial system, adopt. When I see what happened since 2000 with Reg NMS, uh, how the system still works well. I've been under a lot of stress. Rickety system, 16 exchanges, 40 dark pools, and yet the thing works. You push a button, you get a sub-second execution with uh, no sp almost no spread at all. It's amazing. It works really, really well. And yet there are people who want to mess with this thing. Uh, and, and we're going to talk about this in the next couple of days. Uh, and so I <clears throat> am a big believer in the way the system is set up. There are a lot of crooks out there. We need a lot of regulation. I'm a pro-regulation person. But innovation, ability to hire and fire people, a democracy and a system where individuals allocate capital in the most efficient method possible with some reasonable limitations is the reason we have succeeded and why I've watched this industry grow and get better and better. What I really would like to see, and we're going to have to go, more participation. It is greatly disturbing and it should bother every one of you that 90% of the stock market wealth is controlled by 10% of the households. You know all the data. I hope you've all seen it. It's horrifying. We need to expand that because more stakeholders is what makes people want to participate in the system. If there was one thing, that would be it. Thank you for the question. I appreciate it. Everybody, thank you. And remember, you guys, you are dream builders. That's what you are. You're not in the financial services. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Bob.